Okay, so we're going to talk about the Temple of Athena Nike. <clears throat> it was quite small, and it was a design by the architect Kilcrates, who also worked with Ikatinos on the Parthenon. And it has an amphoropostyle temple, which means it has four columns on both the east and west sides. So you can see the four columns on either side, the east and west sides. And it greets all visitors um, entering the Acropolis. So it really commemorates the victory over the Parthenon, or the Persians, sorry. So the sculptures even depicted um, the decisive battle at Marathon in part of the frieze. So that whole idea of really commemorating the victory of the Persians, Nike is the goddess of victory, so that makes sense. Around the building is actually this parapet or low wall. You can kind of see it here, I believe, and it goes all around the building. And it actually kind of shows Athena in all sorts of poses and attitudes. And in one side scene, she's actually erecting trophies, and in others she brings forward sacrificial bowls to Athena. So this particular sculpture from the Nike temple is very famous. It's three feet, six inches high, 410 BCE marble, and it's Nike adjusting her sandal from the south side of the parapet of the temple of Athena Nike. So it shows her, you know, adjusting her sandal. It's kind of an awkward posture, but it's also somehow graceful. Her garments cling tightly to her body. They're almost transparent. There's a lot of folds and which creates a lot of shadow. And once again, the sculpture almost shows the form beneath the clothing. So you can actually really see her body underneath. So it looks like her garments are almost transparent. And really playing with, you know, shadows here with the folds and how deeply they carve the folds. So we're going to move away from the Athenian Acropolis and just take a look at some pieces from the, or one piece at least from the Depylon Cemetery at Athens, Greece, the main cemetery there from 400 BCE around the same time in the early to high classical period, five feet, two inches high. And this actually shows a tombstone or steel that was kind of made in the memory of a woman named Hegeso. And it shows a woman in her home attended by her maid. And she's kind of ex inspecting this piece of jewelry that's selected from a box by her maid. And she wears a thin garment with elaborate, elaborate folds. And you can really see the women's bodies. They're revealed under the clothing, much like what we saw on the Parthenon. And it kind of shows this moment of everyday life for a Greek woman at the time. And it's also showing the life of seclusion that it was experienced by a lot of women during this time in history. Women did not engage in activities outside of the home and were basically always depicted in interior scenes, whereas men, you know, on their grave steals, they were shown in the public domain, often as warriors. So um, it's kind of actually a testimony to, um, I don't know if you would call it sexism, but the patriarchal society that was going on at the time that this was made. And both the slave and jewelry are kind of a testament to the wealth of Hegeso's father, who was um, referenced in the epitaph of this particular gravestone. Um, her mother is not mentioned, so only the father is mentioned. And the jewelry box might actually represent the dowry that the father would have provided to Hegeso's husband had she married. And so we're seeing really that patriarchal side of Greek society kind of hidden away in the seal, in the steel design, but almost also hidden in plain sight. So um, we're going to move into painting. So painting, unfortunately, it didn't really uh, survive because it was painted on large wooden panels, and they typically display those in large public buildings. And they typically, you know, the wood just doesn't last that long. But Greek vessels do help us to put together, you know, what Greek paintings may have looked like because the pottery is able to withstand the test of time. So um, the leading painter at the time was Polynotos, and he, they were very important paintings that were in important buildings in, Athen in Athens and in Delphi. 
And descriptions of his paintings survive, and they tell that he really introduced some re revolutionary compositional ideas um, before, you know, during in Greek painting, all the figures typically shared a common ground line, so they were all shown at the same level, whereas Polygnotos actually started to place his figures on different levels, and he also incorporated landscape elements into the background, and his abandonment of a single ground line was an important break from the past, and we can see that in this piece by the um, I think we're going to the Noe Bid, Bid painter, Artemis and Apollo slaying the children of Niobe, Athenian red figure, Calix Crater, um, Orvieto, Italy, 450 BCE, one foot nine inches high. So Polynotos's influence can be seen on this crater. So Polynotos was an actual painter on wood. Of course, his pieces don't survive, but we know that he came up with the placing the figures on different ground lines. And so this piece shows his influence in the fact that there's different figures on different areas of the of different ground lines, basically. So you can see there's, you know, some ground line down here, up here, down here. So that's supposedly Polynotus's influence. And it depicts the massacre of the Noibids, the children of Niobe. Niobe had at least a dozen children, and then she kind of thought she was superior to the goddess Leto, who only had two offspring, who were Apollo and Artemis. And to punish her for thinking she could be superior to a god, Leto sent her children, um, Apollo and Artemis, to kill all of Niobe's children. And this shows that violent mythological scene. And it also places in some landscape elements, and you can see the figures are all in different ground level, so there's no common ground line in this piece. So this is the Fale painter, Hermes bringing the infant Dionysos to Papales Salantos, um, Athenian white ground Calix crater from Volsi, Italy, 440 to 435 BCE, one foot two inches high. So this shows, you know, what those lost panel paintings may have looked like. So this ceramic vessel is painted in a white ground painting technique, which was actually developed by the Andokides painter, who also discovered the red figure technique, but it wasn't really popular until later times around the middle of the 5th century BCE. And it's usually done on a particular type of vessel called a lakethos, which is a flask for holding perfumed oils. And so the process was that the pot was covered in a fine white clay and then a black glaze was used to outline figures and then they used colors like diluted brown purple red white were used to color in the figures and the artist did use colors such as yellow but those colors were actually applied after firing because the greeks really didn't know how to make certain colors withstand the heat of the kiln and because this painting techniques featured more colors but it happened to be less durable and it was so it was not used on everyday vessels like drinking cups it was mostly used on those perfume vessels or like theos and these were typically placed in graves as offerings to the deceased so we can look at a oh actually let's see well back um so the vessel pictured here this is a crater painted by the Fale painter, and the subject is Hermes handling, handing over his half-brother, the infant Dionysos, to the grandpa satyr, Papas Silentos, Silenos, I believe, and the other figures are nymphs. Um, and Zeus had sent Dionysos, which was one of his natural sons, by a mortal woman um, to this area to hide this child away from his jealous wife, Hera. And the painter only used colors that would survive the heat of the kiln, so red, brown, purple, and white. And the white was used to color the flesh of the nymphs. And for the hair and beard, they used, um, I believe, white as well. And they used diluted brown to color the rocks. Let's see how much time we have. We still have some time. Okay, so next up. And the last one we're going to cover this week is youth diving. 
It's a cover slab of the tomb of the diver from the Temple del Prete Necropolis, Pastium, Italy, 480 to 470 BCE. And it's a fresco. It's three feet, four inches high. Um, so some Greek mural paintings do survive. Um, and this is one of them. It's from the tomb of the diver in Pastum, Italy. And this tomb was pretty small. And on one of the walls, this painting can be found. And it depicts a youth diving from a stone platform off to the right here into a body of water below. And this mostly symbolized um, the deceased's plunge into the underworld. And trees are present as well to kind of frame it in. And there, there's also a decorative frame that runs around the whole painting. So this does give us a, a bit of an idea of what the, the Greek panel paintings may have looked like. But obviously this one survived because it's a tomb painting that was done on plaster and it just tends to last longer. So that is kind of the last thing that we're going to cover in this particular uh, week, I guess, week five, I believe. So anyway, we will continue forward with the Greek uh, chapter in the next week to come.